the Montgomery bus boycott with civil rights protests during which African Americans refused to ride the buses in Montgomery, Alabama in protest of the city's bus segregation laws. The bus boycott was regarded as the first large scale demonstration against segregation in the United States and helped a young pastor by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. emerge as a leader of the civil rights movement. And if this is the type of content that you enjoy, you can find more content like this at whatmikehistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on my Patreon page, my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Also, give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, Let's get started. During the middle of the 20th century, Jim Crow not only separated the races, but controlled every aspect of African-Americans lives, like keeping African-Americans poor. By the 1950s in Montgomery, nearly three fifths of black women worked as a maid for white families and three fourths of employed black men worked unskilled labor. It also kept whites and blacks from learning together, playing together and riding public transportation, along with working class blacks Thousands of black students also rode the buses in Montgomery, Alabama. The problem was everything about riding the bus in Montgomery was humiliating for black passengers. See, in other cities like Atlanta or Nashville, where black passengers sat in the back and white passengers sat in the front, and both groups met in the middle as the bus filled, and as seats were taken, both races would stand. However, in Montgomery, they had their own rules. The first row of seats were reserved for white passengers, and the rear was reserved for black passengers. But if the bus became so crowded that white seats were filled, the driver would move the colored section and order any African American to get up and make room further to the back or stand in an aisle or leave the bus completely. In fact, if one white passenger wanted to sit in a row occupied by four black bus riders, all four of them would have to get up to the back of the bus. Additionally, all riders had to enter in the front of the bus to pay their fare, but unless the entire white section were empty, black passengers had to get off and re-enter in the rear. According to the law, no passenger was required to move or give up their seat or stand on the bus if it were crowded or no other seats were available, but bus drivers simply ignored the law and adopted the practice of requiring black riders to move if there were no seats in the white-only section, and it became customary for black passengers to move when the driver told them so. To enforce this, the Montgomery City Bus Line hired tough men to drive their buses, and the city ordinance empowered the drivers to achieve this goal. The drivers understood that along with driving the buses, their job was to enforce Jim Crow, and many bus drivers went above and beyond even the segregation laws. African Americans were routinely assaulted, shortchanged, accosted, and left stranded even after paying their fares. The roots of the Montgomery bus boycott began years before even Rosa Parks' arrest in 1955. The roots began with the Women's Political Council, or WPC, which was a group of African-American women professionals who were an early force in the civil rights movement in Montgomery. They were organized by Mary Fair Burks. The group initially was created for black women's involvement in civic affairs, promoting voter registration, and to aid victims of rape or assault. But by 1949, Joe Ann Robinson, an English professor at Alabama State College, joined the council. Robinson succeeded Burks as the WPC's president in 1950, and by then, black women were regularly being humiliated on the Montgomery bus service, and Robinson had firsthand experience with those segregated bus lines, so she shifted the council's primary focus to challenging the seating policy. The same time, Edgar Daniel Nixon, who was a Pullman porter in 1945, Nixon was elected president of the Montgomery branch of the NAACP. Later in 1947, he became the state president of the NAACP. Years before the Montgomery bus boycott, Nixon worked for voting rights and civil rights of African Americans in Montgomery. By 1954, Edie Nixon and Joanne Robinson had firmly set their sights on the segregationist policies on the city's bus line, and they regularly met with Mayor A.W. Gale and outlined the changes that they sought for Montgomery's bus system. First, hiring black bus drivers. Second, fix the segregated seating. And third, more bus stops in black neighborhoods. While they succeeded in pressuring the city to hire its first black police officers, they made little progress in their effort to desegregate the bus line. So the WPC's members attempted to meet with bus company officials, but the officials simply stated that segregation was a city and state policy. However, the bus officials did agree to have bus stops 
at every corner in black neighborhoods as a concession. After the WPC meeting with city officials and in the early days after Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court decision in 1954, Joanne Robinson reiterated the council's request in a May 22nd letter to Mayor A.W. Gale stating that there was a growing support among local black organizations for a bus boycott. Robinson wrote, there has been talk of 25 or more local organizations in planning a citywide bus boycott. By 1955, Robinson and Nixon had decided that when the right person was arrested, they would initiate a bus boycott. The person had to be someone that would anger the black community into action, that would agree to test the segregation laws in court, and most importantly, had to be above reproach. So on March 2nd, 1955, Claudette was let out early from school because of a faculty meeting and she was returning home. She boarded the bus, she paid her fare, walked straight onto the bus because there were no white people on the bus at that time and sat in the first colored section seat, two seats away from the emergency exit. As they rolled, the bus got more and more crowded as white folks got off of work. So when a white woman got on the bus, was left standing in the aisle between the seats on Claudette's row, clearly expecting her to get up. The bus driver, Robert W. Cleary, looked in the mirror and said, I need those seats. And the three black women in her row moved to the back. As the other three moved, the white woman was still sitting there across from Claudette looking for her to move. So the driver said, why are you still sitting there? To which another black passenger responded, she ain't got to do nothing but be black and die. The driver continued on, but during the idle moments, Ruth Hamilton, who was a pregnant woman, got on the bus and sat right next to Claudette. So the driver hollered for a policeman and two police officers got on the bus. They soon convinced a black man to give up his seat for Miss Hamilton so she could move into that seat. But Claudette still refused to move and she was forcibly dragged off the bus and arrested. During the ride to the station, they swore at her and made sexual comments about her body. They took turns attempting to guess her bra size and called her a nigger bitch. One of the officers even sat in the back seat with her and this made her fear that she would be sexually assaulted because that sort of thing happened often at the time. Claudette was initially charged with disturbing the peace, violating segregation laws, and assault and battery on a police officer. A group of local civil rights activist leaders came together to discuss Claudette Coven's arrest with the police commissioner and she was bailed out of jail by her local minister, who then told her that she had brought a revolution to Montgomery. Organizers thought they had found the perfect person and began discussing a bus boycott. Cohen's arrest and conviction angered and unified the black community, but when E.D. Nixon discovered that the 15-year-old was unmarried and pregnant, he decided not to use her as a point person because he was worried that she would not be able to command the support of religious conservative blacks. So, December 1st, 1955, when Rosa Parks boarded the Montgomery City bus around 6 p.m., Parks paid her fare and sat in the first empty seat in the row designated for the colored section. This was towards the middle of the bus, about 10 seats behind the area reserved for white passengers. Initially, she did not notice that the driver was James F. Blake from the incident in 1934. And as the bus traveled along its regular route, all the white passenger seats began to fill up. As the bus reached its third stop, several more white passengers boarded. Blake noted that two or three white passengers had to stand because the front of the bus was filled to capacity. So Blake moved the color sign behind where Parks had been seating and demanded her and three other black passengers give up their seat so the white passengers could sit down. Blake said, y'all better to make light of yourselves and let me have those seats. Three of them complied, but Parks didn't get up. She slid closer towards the window seat. Blake's asked, why don't you get up? And she responded, I don't think I should have to stand up. So Blake simply called the police. Simplifications of Parks' story claim that she refused to give up her seat because she was tired rather than because of a protest of unfair treatment but she was already an accomplished civil rights activist by the time of her arrest, having worked for the NAACP and on other civil rights cases. According to Parks in her autobiography, I was not physically tired, no more than I usually was at the end of the day. I was not old, although some people had this image of me as being old. I was only 42. The only tired that I was, was tired of giving in. After she was arrested, she would also state that I knew 
that I was being arrested and it was the last time that I would ever ride in humiliation of this kind. She was charged with violating chapter six, section 11 of the segregation law and the Montgomery City Code. Parks called Edie Nixon to bail her out of jail and Nixon then conferred with Joanne Robinson about the Parks case. Robinson believed that it was important to seize the opportunity because Parks and her husband were very active in the NAACP where she served as a secretary. They were also deeply respected in the community and because of this, they seemed like the ideal person to mobilize a mass protest around. So Nixon had hoped for years to find a courageous black woman with solid, unquestioned honesty and integrity to become the plaintiff in a case so that he could test the validity of the segregation laws. So Nixon convinced Parks, her husband, and her mother that Parks should be that plaintiff. So Parks accepted Nixon's offer both Parks and Nixon knew they were opening up their cells for harassment and death threats, but they also knew that this case had the potential to spark a national outrage. Additionally, the idea arose that the black population of Montgomery would boycott buses on the day of Rosa Parks' trial. Parks, the NAACP, WPC, all agreed that Parks would be the point person for the boycott. Martin Luther King recalled in his memoirs that Miss Parks was ideal for the role assigned to her by history because her character was impeccable, her dedication was deeply rooted, and she was one of the most respected people in the Negro community. Nixon called a number of local ministers to set up a meeting between the local ministers to begin organizing support for the boycott. One of the men he called was Martin Luther King Jr., a young minister who had newly arrived from Atlanta. King said that he would participate in the boycott and that he had already arranged a meeting with his church congregation on the issue. Joanne Robinson would stay up all night printing over 35,000 handbills to announce the boycott. It was state. Another woman has been arrested and thrown in jail because she refused to give up her seat so a white person could sit down. It is the second time since Claudette's Colvin case that a Negro woman has been arrested for the same thing. This has to be stopped. Negroes have rights too. And if Negroes do not ride the buses, they will not operate it. Three fourths of the riders are Negro and yet we are arrested or we have to stand in empty seats. If we do not do something, they will not stop with the dress and they will continue. The next time it may be you or your daughter or your mother. This woman's case will come up on Monday. We are therefore asking for Negroes to stay off the buses on Monday in protest of the arrest and trial. Don't ride the bus to work, to school, or to town, or anywhere on Monday. You can afford to stay out of school for one day if you have no way to go other than by bus. You can afford to stay out of town for one day if you work, take a cab, or walk. Please, children, grown-ups, don't ride the buses on Monday. Please stay off all the buses. The next morning, December 2nd, there was a meeting of about 50 people in the basement of the Dexter Avenue Church. First, Parks told her story of her arrest, and the group created a new organization and selected the name the Montgomery Improvement Association to oversee the continuation and maintenance of the boycott. They also elected Martin Luther King as their president because Nixon believed that King had not been compromised by dealing with the white power structure within Montgomery. Rosa Parks recalled that the advantage of having Dr. King as president is that he was new to Montgomery and to civil rights work and that he had not been there long enough to make any strong friends or enemies. The newly created organization then began discussing boycott strategies. The group proposed a list of demands very similar to demands presented by the WPC and the MIA decided to mount a one-day boycott on December 5th, the same day Parks would be tried in court. As the news of the boycott spread, the protests received unexpected publicity in weekend newspapers on the radio and television reports. In addition to the WPC circulating flyers, black ministers announced a boycott in church and the Montgomery advisor published a front page article about the boycott. On December 5th, Parks was tried on charges of disorderly conduct and violating a local ordinance. After being found guilty, she was fined $10 plus $4 in court costs. The very first day, the boycott proved to be extremely effective. About 40,000 black bus riders decided to not ride the bus that day. Initially, the bus boycott was only scheduled to be one day, but the first day of the boycott was so effective that the MIA began to discuss the idea of extending the bus boycott indefinitely. They believed the bus boycott could be effective because the Montgomery bus system was so dependent on African Americans riders who made 70% of their ridership. But initially, ministers from the MIA wanted to keep the boycott low-key as to not upset 
the white folks. And this was complete opposite of what Edie Nixon and other activists had hoped to achieve. The ministers never expected the boycott to be so successful. And now with the overwhelming support of the black community, they realized that they had no choice but to continue. So by the end of this meeting, the MIA was fully committed to a very public bus boycott. December 7th, 1955, the FBI's mobile office began to forward information on the bus boycott to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover noted that there was agitation among Negroes in Montgomery, Alabama, and attempted to find any derogatory information he could about Martin Luther King. After unsuccessful talks with city commissioners and bus company officials on December 8th, the MIA issued a formal list of demands, and initially the demands did not include changing the segregation laws. Rather, the group demanded courteous treatment from bus operators, first come, first serve, seating on the bus for all, with blacks sitting in the rear and whites sitting in the front, and black operators in primarily black routes. This demand was a compromise for leaders of the boycotts who believed that the city of Montgomery would be more likely to accept this than the demand for full integration of the buses. Ultimately, the demands were not met. Black community leaders began discussing a federal lawsuit to challenge the city of Montgomery and Alabama segregation laws. They felt that Alabama statutes and ordinance in the city of Montgomery provided for the enforcement of racial segregation on privately operated buses violated the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. So about two months after the bus boycott, civil rights activists started to reconsider the case of Claudette Colvin. Freddie Gray, Edie Nixon, and Clifford Dunn had been searching for the ideal case to challenge the constitutionality of Montgomery, Alabama segregation laws, and Dern had concerns about Rosa Parks' case will be tied up in the Alabama court system for years, and as useful as Rosa Parks' case was, and providing them for a valid reason for an uprising in the civil rights movement, it was decided it would not make an ideal case because of the criminal statutes in her case. Freddie Gray wanted the court to only have to decide about the constitutionality of the laws around segregation on buses. Freddie Gray consulted multiple lawyers from the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund and he approached Colvin, Ari Brower, Susie McDonald, Mary Louise Smith, and Janae Reese all the women who had been discriminated against by the enforcement of the segregation policies on the Montgomery bus system, and all of them had become plaintiffs in a federal civil lawsuit that would bypass Alabama's court system. Janae Reese would ultimately drop out of the case in February 1956 because of intimidation from local white folks, and she would falsely claim that she had not agreed to the lawsuit, which would lead to an unsuccessful attempt to disbar Freddie Gray for supposedly improperly representing her. During this time, Montgomery black residents continued to stay off the buses and the boycott proved to be extremely effective. With the loss of black riders, the city's transit system fell into serious economic distress. This was despite city officials and white citizens attempting to defeat the boycott. For example, black taxi cab drivers charged 10 cents per ride, a fare equal to the cost of riding the bus. So city officials began to penalize black taxi cab drivers for aiding the bus boycott. Then the MIA developed an intricate carpool system of about 300 cars to get people to and from work. When the city pressured local insurance companies not to insure cars using carpools, the boycott leaders arranged policies through Lloyds of London. In addition to using private motor vehicles, some people used non-motorized means to get around, such as they cycled, they rode mules, horse-drawn carriages, some people even hitched hiked, but most people simply walked. During rush hour, sidewalks were often extremely crowded. As the bus received few, if any, passengers, the bus company officials asked the city commission to stop servicing black communities altogether. Meanwhile, the ranks of the White Citizens Council would surge. The White Citizens Council was created by white segregationists in response to the Brown versus the Board of Education decision. While it typically drew a more middle to upper middle class membership than, say, the Ku Klux Klan, the WCC still resorted to violence. Both King and Ralph Abernathy's houses were firebombed, as were four black Baptist churches. After King's house was attacked, the news of the bombing spread very quickly and 300 angry African-Americans soon gathered outside his house where King gave a speech stating, if you have weapons, take them home. If you do not have them, please do not go seek them. 
We cannot solve this problem with retaliatory violence. We must meet violence with nonviolence. Remember, in the words of Jesus, he who lives by the sword will perish by the sword. We must love our white brothers no matter what they do to us. We must make them know that we love them. And Jesus cries out in the words that echo across centuries to love your neighbor, bless them that curse you, and pray for them that despitefully use you. This is words we must live by. We must meet hate with love. Remember that if I am stopped, the movement will not stop because God is with the movement and you take this glowing faith and this radiant assurance. In February 1956, city officials obtained an injunction against the boycott and indicted over 80 boycott leaders under a 1921 law prohibiting conspiracies that interfere with lawful business. Rather than wait for their arrest, they turned themselves in as an act of defiance. King was ordered to pay a $500 fine or serve 368 days in jail. However, he would spend just two weeks in jail and the move backfired by bringing national attention to the protest. King commented on his arrest by saying, I was proud of my crime. It was the crime of joining my people in nonviolent protests against injustice. February 1st, 1956, Freddie Gray filed the Aria Brower Gale in the United States District Court. Aria Brower was a Montgomery woman who had been discriminated against on segregated buses, and A.W. Gale was the mayor of Montgomery. The following month, Martin Luther King and 90 of his followers were arrested for conspiring to conduct a boycott, and this led to the ensuing trial to be publicized and help bring light to Dr. King's crusade for civil rights and attention to the Brower Gale case general. Because Browery Gale challenged the constitutionality of a state statute, the case was brought before a three-judge district court panel. On May 11, 1956, the first day of the trial, Freddie Gray had meticulously planned the order of his first witnesses. He wanted to start fast with Aria Brower, who was a 37-year-old, well-spoken black woman, and finished strong with Claudette Colvin. Walter Canabert represented the city of Montgomery, and his strategy was two-part. First, to state that the black community did not object to segregation before the boycott, reminding them that initially they had only pushed for black drivers better treatment, not the end of segregation. And two, Dr. King was the one who stirred up all the trouble and the city tried to paint him as a silver tongue outsider who never rode the buses in Montgomery. But during Claudette Colvin's testimony, Walter Kanabe got right to the heart of the issue and asked her why she stopped riding the buses on December 5th. And she answered, because we were being treated dirty and nasty. Much later, Charles Langford, one of the lawyers for the plaintiff, stated that if there was a star witness in the boycott case, it was Claudette Colvin. On June 5th, 1956, the panel voted two to one that segregation on Alabama's interstate buses was unconstitutional, citing Brown versus the Board of Education as a precedent for the verdict. They stated that bus segregation laws in the city of Montgomery denied and deprived plaintiffs and other Negro citizens similarly situated in equal protection of the laws and due process on the laws secured by the 14th Amendment. Judge Franklin M. Johnson will later state that the testimony of Ms. Colvin and the others reinforced the constitutional position that you can't abridge the freedoms of individuals. The Boycott case was a simple case of legal and human rights being denied. December 17, 1956, the Supreme Court rejected the city and state appeals to reconsider their decision. Three days later, the order to integrate buses had arrived in Montgomery. December 20th, King and the Montgomery Improvement Association voted to end the 381-day bus boycott. And in a statement, King stated that the Euro protest against the city buses is officially called off and Negro citizens in Montgomery are urged to return to the buses tomorrow morning in a non-segregated basis. The city buses were integrated the following day. In the aftermath, the backlash against the court was quick and brutal. December 2nd, someone fired a shotgun through the front door of Martin Luther King's home. A day later, white men attacked a black teenager as she exited a Montgomery City bus. Four days later, two buses were fired upon by snipers, with a pregnant woman being shot in both legs. By January 10, 1957, bombs destroyed five black churches and the home of Reverend Robert Gantz, who was a white Montgomery who sided publicly with the Montgomery Improvement Association. In response, the city was suspend bus service for several weeks due to the violence. 
January 3rd, 1957, a group of Klan members lynched a black man, Willie Edwards, because he was allegedly dating a white woman and the city attempted to strengthen the segregation laws in other areas. By March of 1957, the city had passed ordinances making it unlawful for white persons and colored persons to play together or in company of each other in any game of dice, cars, dominoes, checkers, billiards, or softball, basketball, baseball, golf, track, beaches or lakes, or any other outdoor activity. Later that year, the Montgomery police charged seven clans members with the bombings of the churches. Of course, all of the defendants were eventually acquitted and Rosa Parks left Montgomery due to death threats and employment blacklisting in that same year. According to journalist Charles Silberman, by 1963, most Negroes in Montgomery have returned to the old practice of riding in the back of the bus. Shortly after the end of the bus boycott, Martin Luther King helped found the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or the SCLC, a major civil rights organization that worked in segregation throughout the South. The SCLC was instrumental in the civil rights campaign in Birmingham, Alabama, and the March on Washington. The Montgomery bus boycott had a resounding effect far and beyond simple degree segregation of public buses. It introduced Martin Luther King to the world with his role in the boycott and the boycott garnered international attention to the struggles of African Americans in the United States. Additionally, the Montgomery Improvement Association's tactics of combining mass nonviolent protests with Christian ethics were the cornerstone of the civil rights movement in the United States.